Hey guys and welcome to Hada Gastro. In today's presentation, we will be talking about achalasia. So let's get started. So what is achalasia? The esophagus is the tube that carries food from the throat to the stomach. Achalasia is a motor disorder that affects the lower portion of the esophagus and the lower esophageal sphincter or the LES. The lower esophageal sphincter is a valve that closes off the esophagus from the stomach. In patients with achalasia, the LES fails to open up or relax during swallowing and thus it causes a backup of food within the esophagus. So in the picture at the bottom, you can see the esophagus and the stomach and this is the, the tube that carries the food to the stomach. And just at this junction where the esophagus meets the stomach, we have this lower esophageal sphincter. And normally, during the process of swallowing, this LES or lower esophageal sphincter opens up to allow the passage of food from the esophagus into the stomach. But in patients with achalasia, there's a failure of this lower esophageal sphincter to relax or to open up, and therefore it constricts very tightly and the food is unable to push past through this lower esophageal sphincter and therefore it's unable to pass into the stomach. So we have a lot of accumulation of the food and the food just tends to hover here in the esophagus because it's unable to push past through this really tight squeeze. And this is what achalasia is. So this is actually a picture of the normal anatomy and here you can see what patients with achalasia experience. And this is that failure of that lower esophageal sphincter to relax and it's very tightly shut and of course because of that long-standing accumulation of food and saliva and water and liquids in that esophagus it's going to dilate so that normal size of the thin tube like structure of the esophagus is going to become a larger tube and basically this is what happens in patients with achalasia so what are the causes of achalasia the esophagus contains nerves which coordinate the relaxation and opening of the sphincters of the esophagus as well as the peristaltic waves in the esophageal body. In achalasia, nerve cells in the esophagus degenerate for reasons that are not known. However, many theories have been proposed on the exact cause of the disease. They include infectious causes, hereditary causes, or an abnormality of the immune system that causes the body itself to damage the esophagus, which basically means an autoimmune cause for the disease. So there's no real cause for achalasia, the cause is still unknown, and we have these theories, infectious, hereditary and autoimmune theories that have been suggested, but we still don't know what the exact cause of achalasia is. So what are the symptoms that patients with achalasia experience? Patients with achalasia will experience dysphagia, which is often paradoxical. And this is something very interesting because usually patients who experience dysphagia, which is a difficulty in swallowing, are able to swallow liquids much easier than they are able to swallow solids. But in achalasia, this is a paradoxical dysphagia, which means that the patients are actually able to swallow solids easier than they are able to swallow liquids. So although this may seem a little strange, there is a reasonable explanation for this. And let's go back to that diagram again of the achalasia. So again, we said there is an accumulation here of the solids and the liquids and everything the patient ingests basically just hovers about in this lower esophageal body. So usually in patients with dysphagia, the liquids pass much easier because they're softer and the patient is able to cope with them, to swallow them easier. And this is actually not the case in achalasia because in achalasia, those liquids, they just come down here and sit and they're not strong enough to push open this lower esophageal sphincter. But the solids, the solid food that patients with achalasia ingest have the ability to push this sphincter open. And when those solids push the sphincter open, the food is able to pass more freely from the esophagus into the stomach. So that is why patients with achalasia have this paradoxical dysphagia. They may also experience pain or discomfort in their chest. 
weight loss due to reduced intake of food. So because these patients usually experience that pain in the chest and the dysphagia, they tend to not eat that much because they don't want to experience these symptoms. And because they're not having enough intake of food, weight loss is going to be a problem there. They can also experience heartburn, intense pain or discomfort after eating because that food is just going to hover there in, in that esophagus. And they can also experience regurgitation or backflow. And this is very important because these patients are actually at a risk for a pulmonary aspiration. So all that food sitting in that esophagus has a very big chance to get into that trachea and cause a pulmonary aspiration. So this is one of the major problems in achalasia. So how is achalasia diagnosed? A chest x-ray, which will show the body of the esophagus, may be helpful in diagnosing this condition. And below is an example of a chest x-ray which shows achalasia. And the arrows point to the outline of the massively dilated esophagus. So because of long-standing food in that esophagus, it's actually grown to a massive size and it's greatly dilated. And this will be able to be seen on a chest x-ray. The large esophagus appears as a tubular mediastinal mass beside the aorta and there is also the absence of the gastric air bubble. Also used to diagnose achalasia, we have the barium swallow. And the barium swallow test basically consists of barium sulfate, which is a metallic compound that shows up on x-rays and is used to help see abnormalities in the esophagus and the stomach. When taking the test, the patient drinks a preparation containing the solution of barium sulfate and the x-rays track its path through the digestive system. On the barium swallow test, the normal peristaltic waves of the esophagus is not seen. And there is also an acute tapering at the lower esophageal sphincter and the narrowing at that gastroesophageal junction, producing a bird's beak or rat's tail appearance. The esophagus above the narrowing is often dilated or enlarged to varying degrees as the esophagus is gradually stretched over time. So again at the bottom we have the normal anatomy of the esophagus on the stomach and again in achalasia that sphincter is not working properly and therefore we have this buildup of food which stretches or dilates the esophagus. We have this very tight gastroesophageal junction or this very, or this very constricted LES or lower esophageal sphincter. And this is what a barium swallow test looks like. We can see this opaque material on an x-ray. And it shows us what the inner anatomy looks like. And in achalasia, because that LES or lower esophageal sphincter is so constricted and so thin and tapered, it appears like this with a large esophagus above and a thin tapering of the LES, which is called a bird's beak appearance because it somewhat resembles a bird's beak. And this is the barium swallow test that is used to diagnose achalasia. Also used to diagnose achalasia is the endoscopy. And the endoscopy shows a dilated esophagus with retained food or saliva. And we will also have the absence of normal peristalsis in the lower portion of the esophagus and persistent narrowing as we approach that LES or lower esophageal sphincter. And the last technique that can be used in the diagnosis of achalasia is manometry. And the manometry test is the test that measures the changes in pressures within the esophagus. Uh, manometry tests are almost always used to confirm the diagnosis of achalasia. The test typically reveals three abnormalities in people with achalasia. High pressure in the LES or lower esophageal sphincter at rest. The failure of the LES to relax after swallowing and the absence of useful peristaltic contractions in the lower esophagus. And the last two features are the most important and are required to make the diagnosis of an achalasia. So again, we, we said we have a high pressure at the LES because of that collection of food. We're going to have a very high pressure here at the LES. And of course, the most important thing in achalasia is that failure of the LES to relax. So it doesn't allow the passage of the food. It remains very constricted and thin and it doesn't allow that food to pass that freely into the stomach. So how is achalasia treated? 
Most achalasia treatments involve the lower esophageal sphincter because that is where our biggest problem lies. And these treatments usually aim to help relax the lower esophageal sphincter so food can pass through it more easily. The first line of treatment in achalasia is oral medications and these include the nitrates, calcium channel blockers, anticholinergic drugs and sedatives. Continuing with treatment in achalasia, we have some more invasive methods which include Botox and basically the lower esophageal sphincter is injected with some Botox or botulinum toxin and that causes it to relax a bit and when it relaxes it will open up this little very constricted part and will allow for that food to pass more freely from the esophagus into the stomach. We can also treat achalasia more permanently in a procedure called balloon dilation. And during this procedure, a balloon is inserted into the esophagus and is inflated. And this stretches out the lower esophageal sphincter and helps the esophagus function better. So we have that introduction of the balloon into the LES and the balloon is inflated and it stretches this LES open so that the food is able to pass more freely into the stomach. And finally, in the treatment of achalasia, we have the Heller myotomy surgery. And the Heller myotomy surgery is a laparoscopic or minimally invasive surgical procedure in which the muscles of the lower esophageal sphincter are cut and therefore allow food and liquid to pass to the stomach more freely. Something to note in the Heller myotomy is that the majority of the esophago myotomy procedures are successful but some patients may experience symptoms of gastroesophageal reflux disease or GERD after the procedure is completed. So again in achalasia we have that very tightly constricted LES doesn't want the food to pass down from the esophagus into the stomach but when those muscles are cut what could now develop is the reflux of that food from the stomach into the esophagus because now that those muscles are removed and they're not there to tightly constrict the esophagus content from reaching the stomach, we could now have that stomach content just freely passing into the esophagus. So this is what the major complication of the helomyotomy surgery is. And that brings us to the end of the presentation. So that was all about achalasia, guys. And I hope you found that very interesting and informative. Please do like, comment, subscribe, and share. And if you'd like to download a copy of this presentation, you can do so by clicking the link in the description. Take care and see you soon. Bye for now.